we live in interesting times. For the headlines. First, we are not ready to see. Malacanang said there is no need to conduct a probe on the list of individuals and groups that are allegedly conspiring to oust President Duterte, which his son, former Davao City Vice Mayor Paulo Pulong Duterte, posted on social media. French President Emmanuel Macron is expected to offer fresh concessions to try to end the yellow vest protests. British Prime Minister Theresa May begins a final push to persuade Parliament to back her Brexit deal as the European Court of Justice rules Britain is free to revoke its intention to leave the bloc unilaterally. And Japanese prosecutors formally charged Carlos Ghosn with financial misconduct for underreporting his salary and also serve a fresh warrant on separate allegations. I'm Alma Angeles, wherever you're watching from around the world. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We welcome our viewers here in the Philippines and around the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Cepeda. And now to the news. Malacanang said there's no need to conduct a probe on the list of individuals and groups that are allegedly conspiring to oust President Duterte, which his son, former Davao City Mayor Paulo Pulong Duterte, posted on social media. Presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo made this remark after the presidential son posted a so-called Aus Duterte movement list on his personal Facebook account. Take a look. The list, which has now been deleted, included Vice President Lenny Robredo, former government officials, members of the church, journalists and militant groups, among others. First, we are not privy to the list issued by the former vice mayor. <clears throat> Number two, the president always respects the freedom of expression. And the vice mayor then may have some reasons for issuing such a list we do not know and anybody who feels aggrieved they can always refute the allegation contained in the list <clears throat> that is the beauty of democracy there will be as the saying goes free market of ideas and expressions you know, the former vice mayor is a son, and all sons will react to any plot, any conspiracy that he perceives to be against the father. So it is his right to react on certain things that he knows that we do not know of. Well, given, given the popularity rating of the president, no coup will, no coup, or for that matter, conspiracy will succeed. <coughs> so kung the PNP chance. and the military are in support of the president as well as the majority of the Filipinos. Pulong Duterte even listed the possible meeting places of the said United Opposition. Some are universities, restaurants, and even hotels. Since 2016, rumors circulated that some groups are planning to oust President Duterte to put, to put Vice President Lenny Robredo in power. President Duterte even revealed that Lloyd Nicholas Lewis, one of the people included in the list of Pulong, is part of the ouster plot against him. The list included Vice President Lenny Robredo and other opposition personalities. Vice President Robredo yesterday denied her involvement in this supposed plot and the alleged Aus Duterte movement list, which was posted on Paolo's Facebook account. Ex-Senator Bong Revilla finally faced the public after his acquittal from the charges of plunder and release from the PNP Custodial Center. In a 3-2 vote, 
The Sanjigan Bayan 1st Division acquitted Revilla of plunder but convicted his former staff member Richard Cambe and pork barrel scam mastermind Janet Lim Napoles, who were sentenced to reclusion perpetua or a maximum of 40 years imprisonment. At nagsimula ang pinakamahaba, pinakamadilim, pinakaliligalig na panahon para sa aming pamilya. Kapos na kapos ang kapangyarihan ng anumang salitang na imbento ng tao para ganap na maisalarawan ang malalim na habdi na idinulot sa aming puso, lalo na kay Senator Bong, na mga sumusunod na pangyayari. Ang aming pamilya ay agad ng hinusgahan at hinatulan. Kami ay nilugmok. Ang pinakamasakit ay ang ninakaw na panahon, mahabang panahon sa buhay ni Senator Bong at sa buhay ng aming pamilya. Bago ko tuluyang nakalabas ng Camp Karami, nakita ko yung may pinapipirmaan kay, kay Mayora at kay Lani, yung polis. Tinanong ko, ano ba yung pinapipirmaan mo? Ano ba yun? Sabi niya, formal uh, formal transfer of custody daw. Inili inililipat na daw kay Lani ang custody sa akin. Sabi ko, patay. Kung apat na taon akong nakakustodial arrest, ngayon, naka-house arrest, mas matindi pa ang bantay. Ito, no bail din ito. <laughs> Hindi po biro ang mayuraka ng pangalan. Hindi ganun-ganun lang. Masira, magiba ang pagkatao ng, sa mata ng taong bayan. Hindi biro ang manakawan ng halos limang taon. Pinaniwala ang mga publiko na isa kang magnanakaw. Gayong alam nila sa kanilang mga sarili na imbento lang ang lahat ng kaso. Ipabalik ko ang tanong sa mga nagsapuatan para sirahan ako sa mata ng publiko. Kung sa kanila kaya gawin ito, kaya rin kaya nila magpatawad. Kaya hindi na mahalaga kung mapapatawad ko sila. Ang mahalaga ay... Sa Diyos, sa Diyos, sila humingi ng tawad. Mga kababayan ko, itong labang kong ito ay para sa inyo. Revilla was accused of pocketing 224 million pesos in kickbacks from bogus projects with the aid of Napoles. He has been detained at the Philippine National Police Custodial Center in Camp Krami since June 2014. In other news, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern choked back tears while offering a heartfelt apology to the family of murdered British backpacker Grace Millane as the man accused of killing the young traveler made his first court appearance. Her voice cracking with emotion, Arden said there was a collective feeling of shame in the South Pacific nation over the fate of Millane, whose body was found Sunday in Parkland, just outside Auckland. Arden told reporters at her weekly media conference that New Zealanders were heartbroken for Millane's family and were feeling her death personally. Millane disappeared on December 1st, on the eve of her 22nd birthday, and her family's worst fears were confirmed when her body was found on Sunday. The death was shocked or has shocked New Zealand, which is usually regarded as a safe place to travel and averages less than 50 homicides a year in a population of 4.8 million. Milane was on a year-long worldwide holiday after graduating from university and had been in New Zealand for two weeks after traveling around South America for more than a month. It was her first solo overseas trip and her family became alarmed when she failed to maintain her habit of staying in daily contact. The 26-year-old Kiwi suspect has said was said to have been living in the hotel where Grace was last seen alive. He faced Auckland District Court on Monday charged with her murder. Mm -hmm. 
President Emmanuel Macron will address the nation on the Yellow Vest Crisis Monday and meet trade unionists and business leaders in search of a way to end the protests that have rocked France. Government officials said the 40-year-old centrist would announce immediate and concrete measures to respond to protesters' grievances. The Yellow Vests began staging nationwide roadblocks on November 17 in protest against tax hikes raising the of price of fuel. Donc, j'appelle une nouvelle fois le président de la République à tenir compte de la souffrance qui est exprimée, à y apporter une réponse, à sortir de l'Elysée, à arrêter de se claquemurer, de s'enfermer à l'Elysée et surtout d'apporter les réponses euh, qu'attendent euh, ces millions de Français parce qu'ils restent soutenus par euh, une très grande, une très large majorité de Français. More than 650 protesters were detained in the capital. Shops along the Champs Elysee and department stores around the city stayed shut with their windows boarded up to or boarded up to avoid looting. The Eiffel Tower, major museums and many metro stations were also closed as parts of central Paris went on effective lockdown. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump once again attacked the Paris Agreement on fighting climate change, citing the ongoing protests in the French capital as proof that he was right to reject the pact. Take a look. His morning tweet came in the middle of UN climate talks in Poland where nearly 200 nations have gathered to agree on a universal rule book to make good on the promises they signed up to in the 2015 Paris climate deal. The Paris agree agreement isn't working out so well for Paris. Protests and riots all over France, said Trump. People do not want to pay large sums of money, much to third world countries that are questionably run in order to maybe protect the environment. On Tuesday, he also called the Paris Agreement fatally flawed. The French government replied and urged Donald Trump not to interfere in their politics. Je dis à Donald Trump, le président de la République lui a dit aussi, euh, nous ne prenons pas parti dans les débats américains, euh, laissez-nous vivre notre vie de nation. The protests in France are not directly linked to the Paris Climate Agreement, which was signed in 2015 and has sen since been abandoned by President Trump to the dismay of French President Emmanuel Macron and other Western leaders. Spurred by rising fuel prices, in part due to tax hikes aimed at helping France shift to a lower carbon economy, the Yellow Vest protests have grown into a broad movement against Macron's policies and governing style. The White House officially or official widely touted as Donald Trump's favorite to succeed his outgoing chief of staff John Kelly is instead leaving the administration at year's end, he tweeted Sunday. Nick Ayers, the 36-year-old chief of staff to Vice President Mike Pence, tweeted that I will be departing at the end of the year but will work with the Hashtag MAGA team to advance the cause, referring to Trump's campaign. Trump announced Saturday that Kelly, 68, would leave the administration, the latest key personal move, at a time of mounting pressure from the Russia election meddling probe that comes amid increased focus on preparing for the 2020 elections. John Kelly will be leaving, but I don't know if I can say retiring, but he's a great guy. Uh, John Kelly will be leaving uh, at the end of the year. We'll be announcing who will be taking John's place. It might be on an interim basis. I'll be announcing that over the next day or two, but John will be leaving at the end of the year. He's been with me almost two years now, as you know, between the two positions. So. Uh, we're probably going to see him in a little while. But John Kelly... Ready? Are you ready? So John Kelly will be leaving toward the end of the year, at the end of the year. 
and I appreciate his service very much. Thank you. Thank you all. The impending departure leaves Trump reliant on a reduced group of key advisors, even as he prepares to deal in the new year with a Democratic-controlled House of Representatives. The opposition party will have the power to launch investigations, issue subpoenas, and generally make his life more difficult. To other news now, British Prime Minister Theresa May faces a fight for her political life this week in a parliamentary vote that will decide the fate of her Brexit divorce deal. The beleaguered leader's splintered government appears to be facing a heavy defeat in Parliament on Tuesday on the draft withdrawal agreement she signed with Brussels last month. The text, defining terms on which the island nation leaves its main trading partner after 46 years, is the most important to face the House of Commons in years. Media reports said May was under pressure from her cabinet to try to salvage the deal by delaying the vote and flying to Brussels to seek more concessions ahead of a planned summit with 27 fellow EU leaders on Thursday and Friday. But Brexit Secretary Stephen Barclay told the BBC on Sunday, quote, the vote is going ahead. Prime Minister Theresa May is under attack from more strident Brexit backers in her own party as well as a year of files who want either a second referendum or a pact that maintains stronger EU-UK ties than the one offered by May. Meanwhile, thousands of anti-EU protesters take to the streets of London days ahead of a key parliamentary vote on Brexit, with some of the UK IP supporters wearing high-visibility yellow vests in solidarity with anti-government protesters in France. Isn't it? There was nothing to do with fuel at the beginning, was it? It's moved into something else. Haven't they got demands out about leaving the EU, closing their borders, and uh, taking all the people that haven't got any status to be there out of their country? They want what we want. Territory. We want to look after our own futures, the same as they do. We want to protect ourselves and our jobs and not let the governments take all the money and the rich become richer and the poor become poorer and the poor EU. We voted to leave the EU over two years ago. We could have gone straight on to WTO terms and instead um, the self-servers in the government have decided to do a deal and it goes completely against the will of the people and it's nothing short of treachery. This and now our own government has brought back a so-called deal that ties us even more to the European Union but takes away our representation. It is not Brexit at all and they're pretending that it is. And so we're here to highlight the betrayal. All Two recent polls show that Wales, which voted to leave the EU in the 2016 Brexit referendum, would now vote to remain if a new vote were held. It's a trend that's being seen to some extent across the UK, but a change of heart is by no means a given. Here at the University of Swansea's new campus on the coast of South Wales, there are signs everywhere highlighting much more of where much of the money came from to build it, the European Union. There are similar stories across Wales. In all, this region of the UK receives more than 600 million euros a year from the EU. But that didn't stop over 52% of voters here backing Brexit. I do believe that uh, the universities perhaps did not communicate sufficiently um, with the communities here in Wales to explain carefully the uh, advantages of EU membership. However, since the Brexit referendum of 2016, there seems to have been a change of heart. According to two recent polls, just over half of Welsh people now say they preferred or they prefer to stay in the European Union. At Swansea's market, 
now. Some feel they weren't told enough about the conse consequences of Brexit. I did vote to leave, but I thought just for us to make our own decisions. But now I'm not sure. I think we've got a better deal staying in the EU with what at the moment we're going to come out with. I think there's a lot of regret because I think a lot of people thought leave, we just walk out. But I knew it wouldn't be quite like that. It's so complicated, you know. You're dealing with populations, millions, and it's just, it's not as easy as shutting the door and saying goodbye. Wales isn't the only part of the UK where opinions have changed since the referendum. Across the country as a whole, people are more likely to say they would vote to stay in the EU if there were a second referendum. But while support for another vote has grown, a majority in favor of staying in is far from certain. Europe's top court ruled Monday that Britain could halt Brexit without the approval of fellow EU member states in a victory for pro-Europeans on the eve of a key House of Commons vote. Take a look. Article 50 TEU must be interpreted as meaning that where a member state has notified the European Council in accordance with that article of its intention to withdraw from the European Union, that article allows that member state, for as long as a withdrawal agreement concluded between that member state and the European Union has not entered into force, or if no such agreement has been concluded, for as long as uh, the two-year period laid down in Article 53, <coughs> the EU, possibly extended in accordance with that paragraph, has not expired to revoke that notification unilaterally in an unequivocal and unconditional manner by a notice addressed to the Council, European Council in writing. Following, following a 2016 referendum, Britain declared its intention to quit the European Union on March 29 last year triggering the Article 50 EU treaty procedure that would see it definitely leave two years later on the same date next year. British Prime Minister Theresa May's government insists it has no intention of halting the process and has agreed to a draft withdrawal agreement with the 27 remaining member states. The withdrawal agreement is expected to go before the British Parliament for approval on Tuesday. If, as appears likely, it is rejected, it would raise fears that Britain could crash out of the Union on March 29 without a deal or that it could revoke or postpone Brexit in order to hold another referendum. The news continues here on Eagle News International. We'll be right back. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. More than 150 governments represented by their heads of states or senior officials arrived in Marrakech, Morocco for a two-day United Nations-led conference on migration. They have agreed upon a global pact that sets a roadmap to prevent suffering and chaos for global migration despite opposition and several withdrawals, including from the United States. The Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regularly Migration or Regular Migration was agreed upon on Monday at a UN Intergovernmental Conference in Morocco. The pact was approved in July by all 193 member nations except the U.S. which backed out last year. In addition, Australia, the Netherlands, Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland, Dominican Republic, Chile, Latvia, Slovakia, Estonia, and Italy either refused to attend the conference or ruled out signing the agreement. This compact is not a compact for migration. It's a compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. The compact's essential strength is that it is cooperative, not binding. As a document, it is not a legally binding document, but it has at its core a willingness for member states to cooperate with each other. I think member states came to realize that even though this is a matter of national sovereignty, it is inevitably a matter of state interdependence. That the best way to have your national policies implemented is through the cooperation of your neighbors and more globally of other states. And one of the most significant features of the Global Compact is its recognition of the essential role to be played by many actors, including governments and migrants themselves, of course, but also civil society, academia, trade unions, the private sector, diaspora groups, local communities, parliamentarians, national human rights institutions, and the media. With this in mind, we have decided to establish the United Nations Network on Migration. And this will mobilize the full extent of our capacities and expertise to support you member states in this vital endeavor. According to UN figures, there were 258 million international migrants in the world last year, increasing almost 50 percent since 2000. A rapidly worsening food insecurity situation is threatening nearly 20 million people in Yemen, according to the latest Integrated Food Security Phase Classification or IPC analysis, which was released today by the Yemeni government, the United Nations and humanitarian partners. The World Food Program said its food assistance was the only This preventing massive famine in the country, but fighting high prices and a failing economy are pushing people to the brink. The IPC results show us that what is happening in Yemen is an ever-deepening crisis with 15 million people severely hungry. Among them, 65,000 people facing levels of hunger described as catastrophic. WFP said it had been reaching more than 7 million people or 7 million severely hungry people every month with food assistance and was scaling up its response to reach as many as 12 million people in need of emergency food and nutrition assistance. WFP said its biggest challenge was access. It said it had been able to avert famine in areas it was able to reach, adding that the areas in which people are facing famine are mostly in conflict zones to which it had no regular access. This report is devastating. It realizes our worst fears that people are starving to death in Yemen. They need our help, and we're on the ground doing everything we can. In fact, that report is showing that the number of people on the brink of starvation is doubling. We plan to scale up to about 12 million people as fast as we can, dependent upon the access and the money that we get from people around the world. So we need help, and we need it now. Otherwise, innocent families, little girls, and little boys are going to die. Yeah. <laughs> 
Eight-year-old Maya Mary had to struggle around a Syrian displaced persons camp in Serhilia in northwestern Syria on artificial limbs made of plastic tubing and tin cans. But now this girl, who was born with no legs due to a congenital condition, is walking a new prosthetics after undergoing treatment in Turkey. Take a look. وأقاربي كلهم فرحة لمن شاف ما يرجعت تمشي على أطراف صناعية الحمد لله فرحوا لي يعني كثير والحمد لله أن الحزقة ما تقدر تطلع تلعب ويا الأولاد وترجع بالأطراف الصناعية متغير عنده شغلات كثيرة تغير عنده شغلات كثيرة قبل الله ما كانت تطلع برات الخيمة المفترض بعد ما طلعنا وركبت أطراف صناعية فيها تمشي تروح مع أخوانا للطريق تطلع تتمشى ترجع يمشوا مع بعض يروح ويجوا يلعبوا مع بعض يعني صفت إنسان عادية مثل مثل أخوانها Jamal Khashoggi's final words were, I can't breathe, CNN said Sunday, citing a source who has read the transcript of an audio tape of the final moments before the journalist's murder. The source told the U.S. network the transcript made clear the killing was premeditated and suggests several phone calls were, were made to give briefings on the progress. CNN said Turkish officials believe those calls were made to top officials in Riyadh. Khashoggi, a Saudi contributor to the Washington Post, was killed shortly after entering the kingdom's consulate in Istanbul on October 2. The transcript of the gruesome record includes descriptions of Khashoggi struggling against his murderers, CNN said, and references sounds of the dissident journalist's body being dismembered by a saw. Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan has repeatedly called on Saudi Arabia to hand over suspects in the killing. Saudi Arabia, however, said that they don't extradite citizens. With regards to issuing an arrest warrant, uh, we don't extradite our citizens. I believe Turkey's constitution prohibits the extradition of Turkish citizens. So it's uh, interesting to me that a country that would not provide us with information in a legal format that was requested through legal channels would issue arrest warrants. For his part, U.S. President Donald Trump has refrained from blaming Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, even though the CIA reportedly concluded that he ordered the assassination. The CIA has looked at it, they've studied it a lot, they have nothing definitive. And the fact is, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. The murder has damaged Riyadh's international reputation, and Western countries, including the United States, France, and Canada, have placed sanctions on nearly 20 Saudi nationals. In other news, at least three people were killed after a school bus mounted a pavement in a crowded Hong Kong neighborhood, trapping passersby underneath and injuring 12. Take a look. Two women aged 80 and 70 and an 83-year-old man were killed after this yellow bus careered or out of control in the downtown North Point district. The vehicle rolled down the street after it was parked, terrifying passersby as the driver ran towards it and tried in vain to stop it, according to the police. 
The 62-year-old driver became trapped under the bus and was dragged along for about 20 meters before falling onto the road. Police said the bus traveled for a total of 100 meters, hitting two taxis before finally crashing into a building in a narrow lane lined with shops. In addition to the driver, who suffered injuries to his head, neck, and back, a further 10 pedestrians aged between 22 and 89 were taken to hospital for treatment. Several remain in a serious condition. Hong Kong prides itself on having one of the world's best public transport systems, but deadly bus accidents are not unknown. Five people were killed and 32 injured when a coach carrying Cathay Pacific staff to Hong Kong's airport collided with a taxi last month. A speeding double-decker overturned in northern Hong Kong in February, killing 19 people and leaving more than 60 injured. The bus driver was arrested for dangerous driving. And in 2003, a double-decker bus collided with a truck and plummeted off a bridge, killing 21 people and injuring 20. Six people, included or including five teenagers, died and 120 were injured in a stampede when panic broke out during a rap concert at a packed Italian nightclub early Saturday. The suspected use of a pepper spray-like substance is thought to have sparked the chaos at the venue in the town of Corinaldo near Ancona in central Italy the fire service said in a statement on Twitter. But Carabinieri police spokesman Christian Carrozza later said they were still trying to ascertain that or what had caused the youths to rush out, adding there are three exits and one of these was used. The, victim, or the victims included include three girls and two boys aged between 14 and 16 and a 39-year-old woman who accompanied her daughter to the club. Some 10 people are in a critical condition, doctor said, with at least 120 injured in total. Effectivamente, essa l'hanno portata a casa ancora. Era come un, dicevo, uno, uno zombie. Quanti anni ha? Che c'è 15 anni. Uscita, portata via l'amichetta la, la sua. Essa, l'amichetta la, la sua, eh, si è fatta male sulla caviglia, su una gamba, e invece essa è rimasta proprio su. A dimostrare tutta la sua vicinanza, commossa, la sua partecipazione più intensa al dolore, al dolore e alla preghiera eh, per le vittime e per i familiari. Eh, ovviamente il governo deve sempre vigilare perché eh, tragedie del genere non debbano ripetersi. Eagle News International will be right back.
Welcome back. Japanese prosecutors have formally charged Carlos Ghosn with financial misconduct for underreporting his salary three weeks after the auto tycoon's arrest stunned the business world. Former Nissan chairman Ghosn, 64, has been in detention since his November 19 arrest on suspicion of underdeclaring his income by some 5 billion yen or $44 million between 2010 and 2015. Now, authorities also rearrested him later Monday over separate allegations that he also underreported his income by a further four billion over the past three years. Under Japanese law, suspects can be rearrested several times for different allegations, allowing prosecutors to question them for prolonged periods, a system that has drawn criticism internationally. Monday was the final day prosecutors can hold Ghosn and close aide Greg Kelly before either charging or rearresting them and a further arrest would allow them another 22 days of questioning. In addition to charges against Ghosn, prosecutors also indicted Kelly and Nissan itself. Ghosn denies the charges and is in a combative frame of mind, according to sources at Renault. The company he still formally leads even if the French car giant has appointed an interim chairman. The Japanese firms in the early three-way alliance with Renault, Nissan and Mitsubishi Motors have both sacked the Franco-Lebanese Brazilian as chairman. China summons the U.S. ambassador on Sunday to protest the arrest of a top executive from telecom giant Huawei in Canada as Washington's top trade negotiator rejected suggestions that the case could affect talks aimed at settling a trade war. The arrest of Huawei's chief financial officer Meng Wanzhou has infuriated Beijing, which demanded Washington drop its extradition request and stoked tensions during the trade war truce between China and the United States. Meng faces U.S. fraud charges related to alleged sanctions breaking dealings with Iran. Meng, the daughter of Huawei founder Ren Zhengfei, is in custody awaiting a Canadian court's decision on bail on Monday. Vice President Minister Lei Yu Cheng summoned U.S. Ambassador Terry Branstad one day after he called in Canadian envoy John McCollum to voice China's displeasure. China also urged the United States to take immediate measures to correct wrong practices and revoke the arrest warrant against a Chinese citizen. The statement warned that Beijing would make an unspecified further response in light of the U.S. actions. The U.S. on Friday began a case against the Chinese telecoms giant in a Vancouver courtroom alleging that Meng had hidden ties between Huawei and a company called Skycom that did business in Iran, said a lawyer representing Canada during the court hearing. Canada's presenting the case of, on behalf of the U.S. which wants to extradite Meng. Meanwhile, a top executive with Chinese telecom giant Huawei argued in court documents released Sunday that she should be released on bail from her Canadian jail while waiting possible extradition to the U.S. Now, in a sworn affidavit, Huawei Chief Financial Officer Meng Wangju said that she has been treated in a Canadian hospital for hypertension since she was arrested in Vancouver on December 1st for possible extradition. Meng said that she has had numerous health problems during her life, including surgery for thyroid cancer in 2011. Meng, the daughter of Huawei founder Ren Shengfei, faces U.S. fraud charges related to alleged sanctions breaking dealings with Iran. In a bail hearing, that was adjourned on Friday, Canadian Crown Prosecutor John Gibb Carsley asked for bail to be denied, saying Meng has been accused of conspiracy to defraud multiple financial institutions. He said if convicted, she faces more than 30 years in prison. The extradition process could take months, even years, if appeals are made in the case. Germany was plunged into transport chaos Monday as most train services were halted by a rail workers' strike over pay affecting millions of passengers. Intercity and regional services as well as many urban commuter trains 
were cancelled throughout Europe's biggest economy by the four-hour stoppage from 5 a.m. Deutsche Bahn said. The strike came after talks broke down Saturday between the DB and the EVG Rail Workers Union, which is demanding a 7.5% salary rise for 160,000 employees. DB described the strike as a completely unnecessary escalation, insisting its offer was attractive and met the main demands of employees. DB has offered a pay rise of 5.1% in two phases, with an option for staff to take extra time off instead and a one-off payment of 500 euros, the DPA National News Agency reported. Deutsch Bahn, in a tweet, also denied it had broken off the negotiations, charging that the EVG left the talks and went on strike. DB, meanwhile, said that purchased tickets would remain valid until next Sunday or could be refunded and urged passengers to delay travel where possible. It also called on the union, which threatened follow-up strikes if necessary, to return to the negotiating table quickly. Eagle News International will be right back. Stay tuned. TRCV ang mag-provide na appropriate rating sa lahat ng TV shows. Para o galiin ng pamilya ang responsabling pananood. Be more time, parents! <laughs> rated G, good for all! Ano? Ano? Oops, rated PG! Dapat may mga magulang para sagutin ang mga anong ng kabataan. Ah! Sabi! Rated SPG! Maselan! Ikitan ang paggabay. Pag-rated MTRCV, rated responsable. Welcome back. A massive and early winter storm is hitting the southern United States with snow, ice, and strong winds. More than 20 million people from Virginia to Georgia and west to parts of Mississippi are now under storm warnings and watches. Virginia and North Carolina are under states of emergency. More than half a million people are without power and 1,100 flights in and out of the busy Charlotte Douglas Airport in North Carolina were canceled. A nasty mix of snow and ice gripped the southeast this weekend, leading to treacherous driving conditions, canceled flights, and thousands of people stranded at home. Police are strongly urging people to stay off the road, saying ice is making driving extremely dangerous.
Here's Ben Bernaldez for Sports News. In boxing, Vasily Lomachenko added the World Boxing Organization lightweight world title to his World Boxing Association belt with a unanimous 12-round decision over Jose Pedraza on Saturday. Ukraine's Lomachenko, a three-weight world champion who had never before unified two titles in same class, knocked down Pedraza twice in an explosive 11th round. Two judges saw it 117-109 for Lomachenko, while a third made it 119-107 for the 30-year-old who was fighting for the first time since having shoulder surgery in the wake of his 10th round technical knockout of George Linares on May 12. Garcia is the unbeaten World Boxing Council 135-pound champion. Pedraza making his first defense of the WBL title he won with unanimous decision over Ray Beltran on August 25th was the first fighter to go the distance against Lomachenko since Surya Tatakun in a featherweight world title bout in 2014. Lumachenko has top eight fighters inside a distance since then. In other sports, Malaysian badminton great Lee Chong Wei is to seek the all clear from his doctors in Taiwan after his treatment for nose cancer and probably won't be back on the courts until next month, according to reports. Despite earlier comments from Malaysia's badminton chief that Lee's return to the training courts was imminent, the 36-year-old said he still needed the green light from his specialist. The three-time Olympic silver medalist has spent nearly five months on the sidelines after being diagnosed with early-stage nose cancer and undergoing proton therapy and chemotherapy in Taiwan. The former long-time world number one also cast doubt on whether he will make good on his plan to make a competitive comeback at the All England Open in March. The player now down at 15 in the world ranking has said that he is still eyeing an exclusive Olympic gold medal at the 2020 Tokyo Games. Lee's unsuccessful attempts to capture Malaysia's first ever Olympic gold medal at the three consecutive Summer Games were followed avidly back home as was his long-running rivalry with Chinese superstar Lin Dan. His last shot at the Olympic title at Rio 2016 ended in a crushing failure when the Malaysian lost out to China's Chen Long in a nail-biting final. Nose cancer is perhaps the biggest blow suffered by Li, who was banned after testing positive for a prescribed anti-inflammatory at the 2014 World Championships. Li returned to the sport in 2015 after the authorities accepted he took drugs inadvertently. And in NBA, the Milwaukee Bucks bounced back from a disappointing defeat with a big win in Toronto on Sunday, edging the Raptors 104-99 in a battle of the NBA's top Eastern Conference teams. The Raptors still own the best record in the league at 21-7, but they suffered a second straight defeat after falling 106-105 to the Brooklyn Nets on Friday. Malcolm Brogdon's back-to-back three-pointers with 1 minute and 7 seconds remaining, first tied the score and put the Bucks up 197, a lead they wouldn't relinquish. Brogdon scored 18 points, Giannis Antetokounmpo scored 19 and matched his season high with 19 rebounds for Milwaukee, who fell to the two-time defending champion Golden State Warriors on Friday. Brook Lopez also scored 19 for Milwaukee, who became the first team to beat the Raptors twice this season. He said shaking off the loss to the Golden State wasn't difficult. Toronto have dropped two straight for the second time this season and have lost three of their last four. Sergi Ibaka scored 22 points and Kawhi Leonard had 20 for the Raptors, but Kyle Lowry went scoreless for the first time this season, missing all five of his shots. He did produce seven assists and Toronto coach Nick Nurse had said the Raptors didn't play badly offensively. Meanwhile, these are the results of the other games today in the NBA. And these are the stories for EN Sports. I'm Ben Bernaldez and I'm 1 in 25. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Tumblr. Also, check out our boards and Pinterest and pictures on Instagram. I'm Sam Cepeda. Thanks for joining us. And that's it for tonight's broadcast. I'm Alma Angeles and we're, we're 1 with 25. 25.